The woolly mammoth, they are probably one of the most recognized prehistoric animals known to man. That's due to the many frozen specimens and depictions by contemporary humans in their cave art. The males grew to shoulder heights between 9 and 11 feet and weighed up to 6 tons. Does the Bible provide a clue to their demise? Coming up next, what about woolly mammoths with Michael Ord? Hello, my friends. Welcome to Origins. My name's Don Chapman. I get to be your host today. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. We have a great creation scientist with us today. Michael Ord is here. Michael received his degrees, uh, in his education at the University of Washington, where he was a research meteorologist for six years after graduating. And then he worked for the National Weather Service for another 30 years, but in 2001 he got down to his real passion where he has been doing research and writing and speaking in this whole area of creation science. It's such a privilege to have you with us today, Thank you, Michael. Now today we're going to talk about something that I think is really fascinating. We're going to talk about woolly mammoths. Now we're going to talk about where they lived and then what happened to them. I don't think you can go adopt one today, can you? Uh, no, not hardly. Not hardly. They're <laughs> extinct. Oh, they're trying to clone them, though. Okay. <laughs> well, talk to us about this and uh, what we want to accomplish today. Well, the uh, woolly mammoths were in the northern hemisphere by the millions, millions. and now they're totally gone. Why? Uh, so there's lots of controversy over this, lots of crazy ideas about it. Uh, first of all, what is a, a woolly mammoth? It's uh, essentially it's a hairy elephant with long curved tusks and uh, uh, long hair up to three uh, meter, uh, three feet and has three types of hair. Um, huh. So with the woolly mammoths there's, there's a lot of mysteries involved and I'm going to talk mainly about uh, the mysteries up north, uh, Siberia, Alaska and the Yukon Territory but mainly in Siberia. But by the end of the show we'll know what happened to the woolly mammoths. Yes. Okay, I'm, ex I'm excited. Please share with us. Well, scientists were in for some major surprises or mysteries. Uh, first of all, they di discovered these bones and the tusks. The tusks are, have been used for ivory for 400 years, but scientists discovered them uh, in the permafrost up there, which is permanently frozen ground. What, how'd they get into the permafrost? Also, when they examined them, the bones and tusks generally were well preserved, uh, which means they had to be buried fairly fast. So they couldn't figure out why that is the case. Also, they discovered starting in, well, actually before the natives discovered these, but um, starting about 1800, they, they found some carcasses with the flesh on them that were in the permafrost buried. Um, so how, how do you jam a, a hairy elephant into the rock hard permafrost? So that, these things, they didn't really know. It's, it's, this caused them to think. It's a fascinating mystery. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and it just doesn't stop there. There's no. more and more. Then they examined the stomach contents of a number of them, and they found out it was only half digested. They can identify some of the uh, material uh, in there. And so that, they said, well, that means it had to be frozen rapidly for that state of digestion was the conclusion. It was actually a conclusion from... Uh, uh, Baron Cuvier, the, the French paleontologist in the early 1800s, that came to this idea of a quick freeze idea. It's a reasonable idea, but I don't think it's correct. I think it may be half correct. It was a fairly fast freeze, as I'll get into. Also, it was just not the woolly mammoths up there. There was a wide diversity of animals up there. Uh, the woolly rhino, the uh, cave bear, lots of rams. Uh, uh, different types of sheep, uh, cave lions, 
a huge variety in Siberia. Uh, and they were what in the world were all these animals doing up there? Horses and bisons were uh, a considerable amount. Also, they had these burrowing mammals, ferrets and bee, uh, uh, badgers. What are they doing in permafrost? Couldn't, and can't, and um, beavers. Burrow in permafrost, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, they're scratching their heads. Wow. And most mammals were grazers. In other words, they ate grass. There's hardly any grass up there today. It's, it's a bog land caused by the melting of the permafrost. And the, the permafrost has nowhere to drain, and so it pools about that thick and becomes a bog vegetation, which is actually toxic to grazers. But practically all these animals were grazers. So this is telling us, this is giving us some clues, I think. Also, wildlife specialists would consider them well-dressed uh, giants, shaggy coats, big horns, in other words, very healthy animals. You'd think they would have been a lot more stressed uh, in an environment like that today. Most large mammals went extinct at the end of the Ice Age. Most of them are gone. Uh, in North America, 70% of large animals over 100 pounds went extinct, about 70% in Europe and Asia. So as part of the great uh, uh, extinction at the end of the Ice Age. Some mammals that didn't go extinct now live much further south. So They survived by migrating south. Yeah, yeah they did. So based on, on these clues, from, mostly from the animals themselves, we, we can have some deductions, uh, several deductions about the environment that they lived in. Uh, and this will help us be able to solve the mystery uh, of why they lived up there. There's three mi mysteries, why they lived up there, uh, what they ate, and the biggest one is how they all died. Well, from the diversity of animals, it was a grassland with a wide diversity of plants. That's, a that's quite different than the environment up there today. A it means a fertile soil to grow all that grass. Uh, unlike today, it's a sterile soil. It's a high quality habitat, which is <laughs> unlike today. Also light competition like competition between carnivorous animals and herb herbivores. A long growing season. It implies a, a wet spring. It's and hard to think of winter. Siberia with a long growing season. Something's it, really changed, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, th this is just, just totally yeah. different than what's up yeah. there now. That, this implies snowfall is light and melts early huh. <laughs> for a long growing season. Well, which implies a milder, relatively dry winter, a wetter spring, and then a dry summer to, for a grassland. And it means it's the summer bogs that, that totally predominate up there today uh, were rare, which means little or no permafrost until the end of the Ice Age. No permafrost? I mean, we're talking about a radically different climate up there than today. Something has really changed. Oh yeah, something has changed. The, the mammoth uh, is a major mystery of earth science. I mean, it, it's been around for a couple hundred years and they have not been able to solve it. Uh, for instance, the uniformitarians, uh, Larry Agenbrod and Lisa Nelson say in the book, Mammoths, why did mammoths disappear from the earth? This question remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the past. And you're going to solve it for us today. I'm excited. I'm going to provide a reasonable solution. I think so. Uh, to this mystery. Now, there's three categories of mysteries. There is the uniformitarians that generally try to say that it uh, wasn't too much different than today up there. You know, they believe in present processes over millions of years, so they might grudgingly give a little cooler, a little warmer climate. But from what I've shown you, the climate was radically different. To me, I believe they're clueless. Uh, <laughs> and they even got not even close. Then there's a, a group of uh, non-creationist catastrophists like Emanuel Velikovsky and a few people like that that most people haven't heard of that had these uh, catastrophes with uh, Mars and Venus moving around and causing the, the Earth to shift around from warm to cold climate to freeze the mammoths. Um, there's those. But then there's us creationist, and we're divided on this issue. There's creationists that believe that the mammoth died uh, in the flood and early in the flood. That's one major view. The second major view is that they died at the end of the post-flood ice age, which is the one I have uh, come to believe with looking at the evidence. 
evidence against the flood death is that the woolly mammoths in Siberia, Alaska, and Yukon were part of a larger group of mammoths during the Ice Age. And it's called a, a steppe co a community. It was a large grassland around the ice sheets during the Ice Age. Uh, in the U.S. would be a, a big grassland. Uh, Siberia and other places that not unglaciated in Europe and, and Eurasia. Also, uh, cavemen, which were actually intelligent men living in, in the Ice Age when the weather was horrible. <laughs> they couldn't build houses or they'd blow down. So I'd live in a cave too. Yes, sir. And their, their tools uh, that they brought from the Tower of Babel, uh, you know, they, they wore out and they had to use stone tools. So during their spare time, they would draw a mammoths and other animals on cave walls. And they'd drawn mammoths on cave walls right next to Siberia on the, in the Ural Mountains. So I would say that's a post-flood phenomenon. And here uh, shows the woolly mammoth distribution right here. Uh, the ice is in here. You don't find them in the centers of the ice sheets up in here and in Scandinavia. You find them along the edges, though. Uh -huh. That's because when the ice was either forming or melting back, they would move into that area. But you don't find them in here, which means they're associated with the Ice Age. Also, here's a uh, picture di uh, showing what they did in their spare time <laughs> living in caves during the Ice Age. They would draw woolly mammoths, uh, like near the Ural Mountains. Then we have another issue. It's called the quick freeze. And I had to weigh this one carefully because it's a reasonable idea. But there is some pieces of evidence against it. Um, and here, is, here they are. The number of carcasses is very small. A carcass is any scrap of flesh, and there's less than 100 of them in all Siberia, Alaska, and the Yukon. Less than 100. Well, if you had a quick freeze, I mean, everything would freeze in their tracks, and then according to this, the hypothesis, they'd be buried. So we should find uh, millions of them, the carcasses, but once you find the very few. The carcass freezes, it preserves. So, yeah, it's preserved. And, and that's a rare find, not a common find. Right, because okay. it's rare. It means it's due to rare circumstances, right. which can be explained after the flood and not due to a quick, quick freeze during the flood. Also, these, these carcasses are all partially decayed. When they thaw out, um, sometimes dogs will eat them, but uh, they stink. I mean, they, sometimes they look like fresh meat, but when they thaw out, they really stink. So they, they've been decayed in a quick freeze. The quick freeze idea means that the temperature dropped down to minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit below zero quickly uh, from a warm temperature and just froze them almost instantly. That's the idea. But if they decayed partially, that means that did not happen. Also, they f find fly pupae associated with the bones and carcasses, which means it had time for flies to lay eggs. <laughs> okay. Also, when you examine the stomach contents, there's different seasons of death. Uh, which means a quick freeze would be the same season. So this is against the quick freeze. The stomach contents are also found in partially preserved U.S. mastodons in the northeast part of the U.S. And no one suggests, these mastodons are usually found in, in old swamps. No one suggests that they were quick frozen. So the idea of the quick freeze during the flood has a lot of evidence against it. Can the post-flood rapid ice age account for them? Well, here's a quick summary of the, of the mechanism for the ice age. It was caused by volcanic dust and aerosols that caused cooler summers, mainly over the land areas, not over the oceans. You had uh, the fountains of the Great Deep and volcanism caused a warm ocean that caused much more evaporation at mid and high latitudes that connected with storms to dump uh, ice rapidly, uh, snow rapidly that turned to ice on the land. And the mechanism persisted but waned with time. Now let's focus this uh, climate up there in uh, Siberia. Now just getting rid of the sea ice and keeping the temperature of the ocean at the freezing point, a guy ran a model. That's the only change. He took the sea ice off the Arctic Ocean here. And he, and he got the change in temperature in winter. This is the change in winter. That's in degree centigrade. So look at Siberia there here. 20 degrees centigrade, that's 38 degrees uh, Fahrenheit warmer. Just getting rid of the sea ice. By the way, you find the most mammoths further north in Siberia. Uh, that's the, the concentration increases north. Just, uh, but the temperature of the ocean was still at the freezing point. What if the ocean was 80 degrees Fahrenheit at the start of the flood? 
I mean, we're talking about very mild temperatures in this area uh, early in the Ice Age. Also, you'd have a lot of this warmer air from the Arctic Ocean as onshore flow, keeping this area of Siberia and Alaska warm. So winters would be warm and, and, and summers cool, by the way. And the state of the animals actually verify this. Here's a, a slide of, of the mountains of Alaska and the Yukon and Siberia that were glaciated, but the yellow area is unglaciated. And these dotted areas out in, out in here is if sea level fell about 300 feet uh, during the ice age. I don't think it fell that far, but it shows you that you, you know, they had a lot of territory, even on the continental shelves, to move around. So not only the woolly mammoths and a lot of other animals can easily migrate from uh, the, where the ark landed, and it wouldn't be bitterly cold in these areas in the wintertime, so they could easily uh, march through here and come down an uh, ice-free corridor and spread to U.S., Central, and South America. Now, some people wonder, uh, in a 700-year ice age, do we have time to uh, get millions of mammoths? There are probably 20 million mammoths up there uh, that experts would es estimate. Well, what I did was I found out how fast an elephant will grow, how fast they'll double. And so I went to three preserves in Africa for elephants, and I'll take this one. If they doubled every 10 years, you can have 1.3 billion mammoths in 300 years, so there's no trouble in a 700-year ice age getting millions of mammoths to spread all over the Northern Hemisphere. All right. Well, we got to take a break. You've asked a lot of questions, and you've given us some hints that we want to figure this all out and put it together. Don't you go away, because Michael has some great answers for us about the woolly mammoths when we come back. Stick with us. Today's guest on Origins, Michael Ord, earned his Master of Science degree in Atmospheric Science and has retired from the National Weather Service after 30 years of service. He is currently a researcher and speaker for Creation Ministries International, where he has authored many creation articles and books, including Evidence for Creation in the Biblical Flood and Frozen in Time. Book orders are being taken at 800-616-1264. Mike can be reached at Creation Ministries International, P.O. Box 350, Powder Springs, Georgia, 30127. Or visit the website at creation.com. We are back with Michael Ward, and we're talking about woolly mammoths and what happened to them. And, and Michael's done a fantastic job of laying out all the mysteries related to this and some of the solutions that don't seem to add up but we still need answers to what happened. So please uh, give us some solutions, Michael. Yes, the woolly mammoths uh, in Siberia, the reason they even lived up there is because it was a grassland uh, with uh, mild winters, uh, cool summers, and it was drying through the middle part of the ice age. So they'd be spreading up there by the millions around in Alaska and down through into the United States. But the, the main mystery, of course, is why they died. And to find that out, you go and look at the sediments that they're, they're buried in. And to do that, we um, go to the experts in Russia. Nikolai Vereshigin is the top expert, and he says with a colleague, a particular interest for paleozoologists is the Udama. This is a, a lust layer, or lurse layer, as a rule, containing the largest amount of remains of the late Pleistocene animals. Now, this is a hill. That's, that's left over after the permafrost melts. It melts and forms lakes, but then there's hills. And that's where the vast majority of them are found in those hills. But those hills are made up of windblown silt. Luss, L-O-E-S-S, -S, it's a German word uh, pronounced Lurs, uh, is windblown silt. So that presents some, some pretty good possibilities of, of, of how to explain these things. First of all, at the, and which would tie them in at the end of the Ice Age. So at the end of the Ice Age, why would we have these dust storms? So they essentially died in dust storms or, and were buried in dust storms. Well, why? Because winters were actually getting colder at, at the end of the Ice Age. 
the uh, ocean's cooler, so less evaporation, and more sea ice, so that caps off the evaporation. So uh, you have a drier atmosphere, and it's, since it's so much colder up there then uh, at the end of the ice age, and it was warming in the tropics, you had uh, strong winds caused by strong north-south temperature differences. So you'd have strong uh, dust storms uh, uh, at that time, which brings up the idea that maybe the Dust Bowl uh, era in the 1930s could be an analog or an example of what happened. So I went to the Dust Bowl era and, and found out that it can be calm winds and then suddenly a cold front come through which is the wind uh, pick up the dust and it goes down to zero. And it would cause these big dust drifts like, like this right here that would cover up machinery oh, wow. and uh, houses. And so these dust uh, storms could, could bury moly mammoths quickly. So what we saw in the, this is the 1930s. Yes. The, in the dust storms built these same kind of silt mountains to, mm -hmm. for, for hills that you think might account for how the woolly mammoth died. Well, right, the hills came after, but it would be pretty flat. But, yeah. You know, there'd be, be tens of feet of this stuff after a while. So they, they buried them, uh, those that died naturally in dust storms. But some of this exotic ones could be explained by these gigantic dust storms. Okay. Um, for instance, uh, the, stuck in a standing position, you could have a woolly mammoth get, uh, get caught in a dust storm, turn his back, and the dust starts piling up around him, packing in uh, almost like concrete, uh, like, like the snow will do uh, when it packs into you. So they can end up stuck in a standing position in these giant dust storms. And he, inhaling dust, he could suffocate, which accounts for the suffocation. And trying to move its uh, limb bones, uh, they can break their limb bones, and the permafrost, of course, which is developing at the end of the ice age, would come up, and the cold front would be the, would cool the dust from the top, so he would be frozen fairly fast, but not a quick freeze. So you'd freeze the carcasses. Now, at Hot Springs, South Dakota, there's believed to be about 100 mammoths, mostly a Colombian mammoths, but some woolly mammoths. And a lot of them have broken limbs, and they believe they got stuck in the mud and trying to twist their way out. They broke their limbs, as uh, number one here in this quote by Larry Agenbrod. Uh, so this had happened with mammoths being packed in this blowing dust, they get, uh, which can pack hard. Mm -hmm. uh, Once your legs can't move and you're trying yeah. to move, it's easier yeah, then with easy. the dust on you to break bones. Right. Yeah. So he can break his limb bones. Mm -hmm. Then what about the broken uh, pelvis and broken ribs? I think that happened after he was interred in the permafrost. Okay. And so, as Versch again say, after burial of the permafrost, the organic remains could have shifted vertically within a wide range owing to their physical properties and the features of, of so permafrost. So some of the broken bones could have come after death. Yes, right. Okay. That's what I think. Yeah. Here it says it shifted up, up to 10 to 15 meters is what you see at the boundary of ice lenses. So, so this is kind of a summary. If right. this was fast and quick, which it was, this is a summary. You have a woolly mammoth uh, quickly uh, or is eating uh, grass and buttercups, and suddenly the wind's picking up. He turns his back. Oh, he acts like a snow fence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the dust starts packing around him. He's breathing it. That's a good analogy. Getting worse and worse. And he's suffocating. He suffocates before he's buried. Yeah. Okay. And it's he's in a just on the inside is really killing him. Okay. Yeah. All right. And he's in a general standing position. And pretty soon he's the base of a mountain. Yes. And then further dust storms just bury, him. bury him. And then it's generally flat around there. And the permafrost, that blue area at the bottom, is already formed before. Uh, form. See, the permafrost is forming at the same time the winters are, are getting colder. That's how you do it. So from the cold air and the cold permafrost, it just rises up. And so he's automatically interred into the permafrost. So there's no problem jamming them into the permafrost in this idea. Then you've, you've caused faulting that breaks the pelvis and the, and the ribs. So the post-flood ice age can account for, for all these mysteries. This is a major mystery explained by the ice age. And the ice age is a result of the flood. And the flood is in the Bible. So based on biblical principles, uh, we, I believe we have a reasonable solution. This, this is fascinating because this isn't out of the Bible. But when you take the facts in the Bible and then the logical consequences, it gives us a perfect, uh, mm -hmm. perfect example, which kind of is a secondary proof that the Bible's true. Mm -hmm. Thank you, my friend. What You're fascinating welcome. research. And I think many of our young viewers, because people love woolly mammoths like they love 
dinosaurs. And this is going to be a show that is going to, uh, I think, break new ground and uh, be exciting. So thanks so much for sharing with us. You're welcome. My friend, you know, we saw tremendous change on the Earth during uh, the time after the Ice Age and after the flood. We saw the land be totally different. You know, God's preparing a place for you that's not like this place. And we're going to live in a place that is so much better than this because God is about change. He's not static. He's new and dynamic. And He's preparing a place for you right now. The thing is, are you preparing your heart to be with Him? As we look at this dynamic God who made woolly mammoths and then made them go away, someday this world's going to go away. And you need to know where you're going to be when that happens. And you need Jesus Christ to be your Savior and to be in your heart. So as you look at all of this and as you prepare to be with us again, don't you forget, my friend, that it's God's view that He created you. And that that should be your worldview too. Hope to see you again soon here on Origins. And until then, God bless you, my friend. Good to have you with us. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program, number 1308, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.